Well, to discuss this, I'm joined from Moscow by Andrei Baklitsky. He's a consultant for the PIR Center, which focuses on Russian affairs. In Taipei, former chairman of Republicans Abroad, Ross Feingold. He now works for the political risk consultancy firm DC International Advisory. And finally, from Washington, D.C., is Larry Korb, a senior fellow at the Liberal Think Tank Center for American Progress. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Larry Korb, let me start with you. The Helsinki Summit. The former CIA director, Brennan, calls Trump's performance there, or the press conference at least, treasonous. Would you go that far yourself? Well, there's no doubt about the fact that President Trump undermined American uh, interests, whether it would hold up in a court of law that he did this on purpose. But he certainly didn't fulfill his constitutional responsibilities uh, to preserve and protect uh, the United States. Ross, he undermined American interests. Would you agree with that? Well... Well, obviously, there are many people in the United States Congress and certainly in the media and other pundits who, in the hours after the press conference, are saying that the president should have handled it differently. But whether United States security or the safety of the American people is any weaker than it was prior to the press conference, and keeping in mind our focus is on the press conference, not any substantive agreements between the two countries, Again, I think it's open to debate whether the security of the United States or the American people is any weaker than it was prior to the press conference. Okay, but, but again, I mean, I wasn't asking if the security was weaker, but the fact that, let's look at one of the details, Ross, the fact that all Putin had to do was say, it wasn't me with regards election interference, that was enough for Trump to take him at his word against the advice of his intelligence agencies, uh, against the advice of the FBI. How does that sit with you as an American? Well, most Americans who, who have taken the time to read the indictments and the reports issued by various congressional committees have taken the view that Russia did, in fact, interfere with the election. But uh, all of us on TV or the reports have clearly not persuaded the president to take a different view. But again, the key thing here is, is the United States any less safe? Is our, our elections, our next major election in November, any less safe because of what President Trump said? I think that's, again, open to debate whether the president has damaged American security by his view on, on whether or not Putin is telling the truth. Andre, they must be loving this in Moscow, looking at how divided the U.S. over this and how angry on both sides of the political spectrum so many people are at their president, which seems to be seen as a victory for Vladimir Putin and a defeat for Donald Trump. Is that, I guess, going down well in Moscow? I don't think that this is uh, how it's perceived in Moscow. Uh, president Putin went to Helsinki with an idea to uh, solve uh, or improve relations with the United States. Uh, the summit, summit ended it up with few deliverables, and uh, if anything, it produced a huge backlash at home. Uh, Russia is sort of getting used to this kind of uh, relationship when uh, President Trump promises something and then he cannot deliver because of the constraints at home. But I don't think that the results of the summit too are seen very positively in Russia in terms of deliverables. Okay, so talking about deliverables, Larry Korb, when we go beyond Trump saying nice things about Putin and saying he trusts him and he doesn't trust, you know, the FBI and the CIA and whatever, when we look at the geopolitics, you were you were at the table, you were within the State Department, you were within the corridors of power. A sober look at it. The sanctions on Russia are still there. The U.S. position on Ukraine is still the same. The U.S. believes Crimea belongs to Ukraine. The two are very different when it comes to Syria. With all of that in mind, is this just a bit of an overreaction at the president who probably doesn't have the finesse of a Barack Obama or someone else just having a bad press conference? No, I think it was. He didn't even read the briefing papers that he was given by his own uh, staff. <clears throat> and the other thing that really worries me, this was an opportunity to deal with the most critical issue between the United States and Russia, and that's the Strategic Arms uh, Limitation Agreement, which is, uh, supposed, which is uh, will expire in 2021 unless something is done. President Putin, a year ago, called President Trump and said, we can extend it for five years without going through the Senate or the Russian Duma. I think that makes sense. 
Trump said, no, he, he want, didn't want to do it. It was a bad deal. And, and that, in fact, uh, anything that Obama negotiated, in his view, is a bad deal. Well, it's the, the deadline for that is getting close. Both the Russians and the United States are modernizing their nuclear arsenals. This, he should have taken the opportunity at this summit to say, all right, I accept your offer, let's extend it, and then let's work on a new agreement and also on other arms agreements like the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Agreement negotiated by President Reagan and Secretary General Gorbachev, which both sides have accused the others of violating. That was the key issue. These other things, I agree that, you know, they, they haven't, don't undermine U.S. security directly, but that was a missed opportunity because you had the two of them there. They could have uh, agreed on that, and it can just be ratified. Our ambassadors could sign it, the secretaries of state and the foreign ministers could sign it, and that would put that issue uh, uh, away for a while while we work on what to do next with nuclear weapons. Andre, compare for me how the Russians feel about Donald Trump compared to how they felt about Barack Obama? Well, there is this uh, thing uh, which happens regularly in Russia when a new U.S. president comes and everybody believes that we'll have a new start and this, uh, no pun intended, and this will, you know, bring us to some kind of sustainable uh, relationship. It was the same with George W. Bush, then it was the same with Barack Obama, and he was very welcome uh, in Moscow when he was first elected, and the same with Donald Trump. Uh, but then, uh, as the times go by and uh, the uh, divergent points uh, between two countries multiply, it, every next president ends up as not the, the, the best option for Russia. And so I guess uh, President Trump will be making the, the, the same turn in the end, unfortunately. Ross, I want to bring to your attention a tweet from the former head of the KKK, David Duke. I'm going to read this out to you. He said, Bravo Trump, bravo Russia, bravo to all the true American patriots who put America first and peace and justice first before the Zionist deep evil state ruling America media, American media and politics. Russia has values America once had and America the values that communist Russia had. Ah, as a conservative American, the fact that, I don't know, the KKK wants to smuggle themselves into this and claim a piece of it, it's a little ugly and icky, isn't it? Well, certainly it's disgusting, and there's no room for that in mainstream politics in the United States, whether on the left or the right, whether among progressives or conservatives. And President Trump has had a battle of accusations that he welcomes the support of this element uh, of the American political scene. And he, he's done a fairly outspoken job of saying that he doesn't welcome their support. It's never enough for the more liberal media outlets in the United States. But yes, it's something that he'll continue to battle. However, in the scheme of things, this is largely irrelevant because it doesn't have any bearing whatsoever on policy decisions in the White House. Is that true, Larry Corb, that this doesn't have any bearing on policy decisions? Because we've, we saw how Trump had, uh, in, in many ways, had a certain constituency in the build-up to the election. You can call it the alt-right, you can call it the far-right, whatever you want to call it. And there seemed to be this kissing point among those, especially in Russia, who, who had certain ideas of um, white supremacism, if you like. That is being expressed by someone well, like David Duke. Now, and after this meeting, we're seeing him feeling kind of emboldened that these two leaders represent something new and powerful in the world. Does David Duke's sentiment mean anything in terms of politics and policy? I hope not. And unfortunately, you know, President Trump, when we had the riots in Charlottesville, said they're bad you know, good people on both sides. Uh, I mean, you know, neo-Nazis, well, they're not good people. And I think he undermines his moral leadership at home and the world. The United States is just not an overwhelming military and economic power, but it stands for something. And American ideals, that's what people have fought and died for. And he is under, undermining those. And that's what I really 
worry about. I mean, I wonder after that meeting with Putin, if Putin will feel emboldened now, well, maybe I can go into the Baltics. He said it was okay to be in Ukraine. And when he was asked the day before what is the biggest threat to the United States, he said the European Union rather than dealing with Russia and, and, and China. Yeah. So, Andre, the fact that Trump calls the EU a foe, the fact that Trump is fighting with Justin Trudeau at the moment, or was most recently fighting with Justin Trudeau, um, the fact that his traditional allies are not quite sure about what he thinks of them, especially the NATO alliance, and he's being very kind to Vladimir Putin. Does that mean the Russians have a clear path to do whatever they want to? And for example, they can go into the Baltics, as Larry Korb says, and maybe Trump won't do anything about it. Well, first of all, uh, this whole Trump phenomenon in the foreign policy creates strange bedfellows. You're right that he said that the European Union is a foe and the U.S. are in kind of trade war with the European Union. But the same tariffs have been applied to Russian steel and aluminum companies. And Donald Trump has accused uh, Germany to signing a contract for a pipeline from Russian gas which is counterintuitive if you think that he is a best friend of Vladimir Putin. Um, I wouldn't think that Russia feels uh, super emboldened to do whatever it wants. Uh, at the same time, uh, Russia was doing uh, what it perceived as the right thing uh, with the previous president. It, uh, the, the previous U.S. president will probably do it. Now, I don't see any Russian interest in doing anything in the Baltics. But uh, I, if you remember Crimea, I guess it wasn't the main issue what the U.S. president is thinking on the issue. Okay, so Larry Korb, maybe less constrained, but hardly a green light to do whatever the hell they, wa they want to. Well, we hope not. And as I say, you never know what's going on in Putin's mind. I mean, if anybody would have said that he would seize part of, you know, uh, Ukraine after violating the Minsk agreement with the Russians that signed on to with the United States and the Ukrainians and the British if Ukraine got rid of its nuclear weapons. He, viola he violated that. And yes, sanctions were put on, but Trump did not want these sanctions put on. If it was up to him, he would uh, uh, pull, them, uh, pull them off. And so the idea that Tr uh, Putin may, as a result of this conference, say, well, you know, <clears throat> he uh, accused me of meddling in the election. I denied it, and he went along with me rather than his own intelligence. Maybe I can push the envelope here and see. And that's what we find. Most wars may are started because of, of people not appreciating, you know, what would happen and, and don't have the, the right, right view. And, and, a, and, a, and again, given what he did to NATO last week and the comments he made, you know, Putin's got to wonder whether they'll stick together if, in fact, he does something like go into the Baltics. Yeah. Ross, we saw last week's indictment of 12 Russian military officers in the hacking and leaking of, of, of Democratic Party emails. The, you know, they, 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 shed, they shed some light on, on the fact that the Russians were, you know, looking to maybe make a bit of mischief uh, and sow so some discord within the American electorate, even if it wasn't to actually hack the elections as such. We saw the situation with Maria Butina and, and her charge trying to wield influence on behalf of the Russians to try and, you know, mix, mix things up a little bit, keep the Americans busy. Is there any amount of evidence that has come from the Mueller investigation, Ross, that, that you would look at and say, okay, maybe there's something here and maybe something was awry. Maybe they didn't go all the way. Maybe they didn't actually rig the election. But they certainly did meddle and, and, and play games. And this president is doing his country a disservice by failing to even recognize that in the face of proper, authentic, credible investigations. Well, the investigations have proven to be credible. And, and anyone who's taken the time to read the indictments, whether it was uh, the most recent Mueller indictments or the earlier indictments of, of the Russian Internet Agency, uh, it's clear that both the investigative agencies in the, in the Department of Justice, the special counsel's office, as well as our intelligence agencies, whether it's the FBI or the CIA, and the other parts of the intelligence community have done a very thorough job proving that Russia did interfere in the U.S. election. Whether they changed any votes as of now, it appears very unlikely. But clearly, Russians working with the Russian government were involved. President Trump is not going to change the way he talks about it in a public forum, though. And I think we have to manage our own expectations for how President Trump 
is going to deal with, with the facts. But look, we, we know that the evidence is clear about Russia's behavior. And there's a consensus across the United States political spectrum, both among Democrats and many Republicans. Not all Republicans. There are still Republicans in Congress who question the evidence. But it's, it's clear right. what Russia did, and most people don't dispute that any longer. Uh, Andre, is the view in Moscow that we didn't do anything wrong, this is nonsense, or sure, we tried to meddle a little bit, but America does the same? And it's all par for the course. Everybody plays this game. The official Russian position is that Russia did not uh, interfere in U.S. election, and that's being maintained. And I don't think it will change uh, whatever the investigation in the United States proves. Uh, but what you do see in Russia is the um, better understanding of the fact that this is a very sensitive topic in the United States. Because I remember when it was, you know, beginning the investigation, uh, a lot of people here and people who study United States are saying, look, they simply are reacting. Uh, obviously, there was no change to uh, the voting uh, itself. Obviously, this, the, I mean, why, why is this fast? Now we see change and Russia more and more understands that uh, some nerve uh, was pinched here and the mm -hmm. uh, general U.S. Uh, public is furious about this. And you can see at the summit, uh, President Putin saying, like, look, uh, we can cooperate with Mueller investigation. If they send people here, they can uh, be present when we question uh, the people uh, which were charged. So you can see the dynamic here. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this was missed uh, in the backlash in the United right. States after the, the, the press conference. Yeah, talking about pinching a nerve, Larry Corb, did you see the New York Daily News front cover today? <laughs> I did. Open treason. So basically Trump basically assassinating Uncle Sam and with Putin at his side. So let me kind of expand on this a little bit. For those who feel that liberals or Democrats or both or progressives, whatever you want to call them, anybody who's anti-Trump, they have this feeling that, sure, there's some stuff going on with Russia, and maybe this guy in the optics and, and so forth is not dealing with it properly. But for those who look at something like that and feel that maybe the left has lost its mind because they just can't handle that Trump is the president, is there a case for that? No, I don't think so. I, I think basically, and it, it, as you've already pointed out, you've had a lot of Republicans. If you read what the most you know, damning statement yesterday was from uh, John McCain mm -hmm. when he you know, talked about what uh, Trump had, uh, had done. And yes, John Brennan worked for President Obama, but he's a career uh, intelligence, uh, intelligence officer. So it's not just you know, Democrats or quote unquote uh, liberals doing this. I think the fact of the matter is that yesterday was probably a turning point even for many Republicans who stayed with Trump because they've been worried about their <clears throat> reelection, uh, you know, chances. The whole yeah. host of them came. In. Lindsey Graham, who had been a, a big supporter, you know, the senator from <clears throat> South Carolina, came out and, and criticized them. So I think yesterday really was something that just didn't offend liberals like some of his immigration policies uh, do. I think this really offended uh, the people who are concerned about national security in our country from both parties. Yeah, and it's interesting. And for the record, Senator John McCain, as you mentioned, to be fair to you, on the right, said, and I quote, I'll quote this before I leave you, gentlemen. He said Trump's press conference appearance was one of the most disgraceful performances by an American president in memory and a tragic mistake. President Trump proved not only unable but unwilling to stand up to Putin. No prior president has ever abased himself more abjectly before a tyrant. Not mincing his words. Gentlemen, I'm out of time. I've got to move on. But I thank you all for joining us here on the Newsmakers. Larry Korb, Ross Feingold, and Andre Baklitsky. Thanks again.